Hello, everyone. Hey, welcome to the Things Agriculture webinar. I'm Rish, and I will be your host for today's webinar. A little bit about myself. Uh, yeah, I'm Rish. I'm from the Things Industries, and I ma mainly head the commercial activities. I've been with the Things Industries for a little over six years now, so you could say pretty much since the beginning. And yeah, I'll be your host uh, for this webinar. And uh, yeah, this webinar is uh, part of the series of the Things Conference, which I think you guys must have uh, seen some events that we did in the past, the Spring Global Conference that we concluded recently. We had the vertical uh, webinars and conference. So this is part of the conference webinar series, and it is leading up to the big Things Conference event in September, which I hope all of you are excited about. The event, the Things Conference, will take place on 22nd and 23rd of September. Uh, so save it in your calendars. It's the fifth edition of the Things Conference. and It'll be in Amsterdam, and you can also join in virtually. We have plenty of partners confirmed, and we have lots of surprises for you. So make sure you get your ticket and make sure you have your travel prepared. The topic for the Things Conference is going to be digital transformation. And we're going to dive into how LoRaWAN is enabling this transformation across different industries that we have. So back to the agriculture webinar. I'll play a small video here to see what we have coming up. And then we will continue with the webinar. Things Agriculture Webinar. Today, I'll talk really quickly about the Things Conference, and then we'll discuss what makes agricultural IoT so difficult. Then, we'll talk about why LoRaWAN is so awesome and why it's uniquely prepared to, de to deal with these difficulties. Finally, we have interviews with Semtech, Blues Wireless, Tectelic, Earnest, and All IoT. So first up, the Things Conference. We're getting closer to the fifth edition, so save it in your calendars, the 22nd and 23rd of September in Amsterdam. We've got lots of exciting partners confirmed and many surprises prepared. The topic of this edition is digital transformation, and we'll have speakers approaching topics like LoRa Cloud, using LoRaWAN Multicast, and personal safety in town centers with LoRaWAN. Do you know about our certification program? On the thingsnetwork.org slash learn, you can get certified to demonstrate your LoRaWAN knowledge. The top certification performers will be invited to the Things Conference 2022. There you get a chance to gain access to all of our certifications, and if you pass any certification exam on the Things Network, you get complimentary access to other exams. You can share your certification status on LinkedIn, and you get a chance to receive valuable rewards as a top performer. So what makes agricultural IoT so difficult? Number one, rural areas. Rural areas usually have no 3G backhaul and often have unstable power. This makes IoT really difficult. In addition, Agriculture often has a very, very large coverage range. Tom Zemir from IoT Experts gave a presentation at the Things Conference Agriculture about the specific difficulties of LoRaWAN in agriculture. Two difficulties he identified are low sensor density and single gateway deployments. But LoRaWAN is uniquely suited to deal with a lot of these difficulties. With LoRaWAN, you can create your own coverage because the spectrum is license-free. You have ultra-low power, ultra-long range devices, and so you can often cover a huge range with just a single gateway. And also, adding gateways is really affordable. Like we mentioned before, there's a strong certification program and a strong ecosystem, so it's really easy to find devices that are suited to any use case. Great, great. So before we talk about uh, what are the different use cases that we have and we dive into this webinar, let's just take a step back and uh, and see what are the different components that we have in any LoRaWAN use case, see how it applies in an agricultural setting, and then we dive further into it. So to keep it simple, on a very high level, you have four main components in any LoRaWAN use case. The first one is your sensors, and these can be sens sensors such as a simple temperature sensor or a tracker or a water wall sensor. Second one is your gateways, LoRaWAN gateways. You have indoor gateways, outdoor gateways. Third is your network server. Uh, that is what we as a company provide. And fourth is your application server. So keeping all these uh, components into place, uh, we as the Things Industries, our main product is the network server, which allows you to easily connect, add devices, and make sure that your solution is scalable. We, our main product is the ThingStack, which you can deploy as a managed service or you can use it as a self-managed service. 
Uh, to get started, uh, we have a discovery tier where you can get started for free. You can evaluate your proof of concept. And if that works out, you can e uh, easily scale your LoRaWAN use case. Now, diving a bit into agriculture, let's look at the main top use cases that we come across within agriculture. The most common use cases that we see is mostly around tracking your assets. So a farmer or a, uh, has a lot of cows or cattle they want to track. That's one very simple use case that, that we see quite common across our uh, customer base. Uh, you might also want to uh, track your machines uh, that you have on a farm. So tracking your assets is one main category under the agricultural use case. Second one you could look at is crop yield. Uh, so if you want to increase your crop yield, you have a limited amount of resource, you want to increase that, then you have use cases which can do things such as uh, soil moisture monitoring, or maybe you want to improve your irrigation. So you have this as the second category. Third is also a lot of uh, people use it for external conditional monitoring. So uh, things like monitoring temperature, wind, sunlight. And then fourth, you could say miscellaneous use cases, which are typically around, for instance, storage, or uh, you have uh, like your barns and you want to uh, make sure that uh, it's, it's, it's fenced properly. So you have the fourth type of uh, use cases. And as Ben just mentioned, LoRaWAN on a farm, is it, it makes it quite unique because of its long range. And we see also in a lot of farms, you typically don't really have any connectivity which exists. So LoRaWAN then really finds its unique place because you can set up these outdoor gateways and you can cover large areas of farm, which, like I said, typically don't have any, any, any cellular backhaul or any other type of uh, back, backhaul available. So it makes it quite easy. Now with the, within the LoRaWAN ecosystem, you have a lot of devices and gateways which are available in the market. So it's easy to get started before you had to look out for devices. But now since there are so many options, you can easily uh, get started with that. And we, as the, we also have a broad range of partners and customers who can help you get started with it. And today, this is the theme. We are going to uh, go through some of our partners who have uh, a lot of one use case in agriculture. Um, and uh, to, to kick this off, I first have uh, Carlo, Carlo Tinella from Semtech. He's the senior product manager. And uh, he has more than two decades of experience in the semiconductor industry. And he's really fascinated by what the potential of LoRa technology is and how it can contribute to a better, safer, and a more sustainable world. So without further ado, uh, let me pass it on to Carlo. Uh, and he's going to take it up. So can you hear me? Yeah, but I cannot hear you. Yes, can you uh, okay, okay, fine. Uh, yeah, yeah, fine. Yeah, yeah. So really, um, I'm sorry because I, I'm struggling with the um, connecting with my PC, so I have to take the the, the connection with my phone. So maybe the, the quality will be uh, worse. So really, I'm sorry for that. Um, so I'm very glad uh, to to join the webinar. Really, thank you so much for inviting me. Um, and I'm very glad to share my experience here uh, with you guys um, uh, about how we, we are driving, we are seeing uh, lower adoption, lower one adoption in the agriculture market. And um, our experience is that uh, uh, the, the, the fast rising use case uh, uh, we are seeing in, in this vertical is really livestock monitoring. Um, monitoring and tracking in some cases, especially for cattle. cattle okay, so the, the, just to give you some numbers, uh, worldwide cattle um, herd uh, accounts for, for almost 1 billion. Uh, uh, so there are 1 billion of cows out there that are waiting to be monitored and tracked. Uh, of course, not everything, uh, not every, everything can, be, can be tracked by, by day one, but almost 50% of this number uh, is managed in, in high revenue regions where we see uh, the, 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 I would say the quicker adoption, actually. Okay? Uh, in Europe, I'm based in France. In Europe, we have uh, 24 uh, millions of uh, dairy cows, uh, which represents the highest level asset in that sense. Okay? So uh, the market is quite big, uh, very easily uh, can, can, can reach uh, several tens of millions uh, for the first adopter. Uh, we are seeing uh, uh, high demand uh, for solutions that are capable uh, to offer more visibility on the earth, 
uh, and the activity of the animals, actually. Uh, the aim is twofold. Um, one is to minimize uh, treatment costs uh, with early detection of all the uh, issues. Uh, the second one is uh, really um, heat detection to optimize um, breeding and insemination programs, okay? So in both cases, uh, we have your tags or collars that uh, uh, sense uh, vital parameters uh, or especially uh, some special behaviors, uh, such grazing, uh, feeding, um, rumination, resting, uh, uh, activity, temperatures, um, those kinds of things, mounting. Uh, and um, uh, those uh, behavior may, may or may not uh, uh, be processed uh, locally uh, with some kind of an intelligence at the edge. Uh, and after that, this operation, if it happens, uh, they, we have uh, data that are periodically uh, sent out to the cloud uh, where there are sophisticated uh, behavioral models uh, that are essentially the the, the know-how of those companies that offer those uh, platforms. And so these this behavioral models may trigger alarms if something is identified as abnormal, okay? So this is really what is uh, now growing as adoption. Uh, now, where animals can move also across large, uh, large area, large distances, uh, like it may happen in uh, uh, South America, in US, uh, Australia, I, I can guess also in India, there is also a need to geolocate the animal. Uh, this is needed to minimize theft, uh, poaching, or even the danger of death during calving, uh, calving events. Uh, and this is really the, the need of geolocate the, the animals, uh, identify where it is, uh, not only how it is behave, it's behaving. So this is really driving also a lot, a big interest into our lower age uh, solution which, uh, as you might know, uh, offers a highly integrated uh, low power geolocation um, capability. So uh, the adoption of those uh, monitoring solutions is today mainly driven by, by the need to reduce costs and increase uh, operational efficiencies. But in some higher revenues regions, we are also seeing uh, a strong push coming from, uh, uh, from the regulation and the consumer awareness that are seeking uh, um, more visibility and, and transparencies uh, into the, 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 the tracing of the wool food chain. So this is really the, the main, um, I would say, feedback that I can provide. And I'm very enthusiastic to see this uh, uh, use case uh, ramping up in our, uh, uh, say, uh, uh, um, uh, across our ecosystem. Oh, you are on mute. Sorry. Yes, yes. No, that was a uh, pretty interesting. Uh, you are on mute. Uh, I cannot hear you. Uh, how about now? Yeah. Is it? Uh... No. One second. Uh, I still I... can cannot hear you. Uh, yeah, I, I think it's only Carlo. You who can't hear us, but we we can uh, we can uh, we can hear you. Uh, how about mm. now? No. No, I'm sorry, but I cannot hear you. Oh, okay, I think uh, everyone else can hear you, but uh, you can't uh, hear us. Um, no, I don't think. Uh, yeah, this is going to work. I will save. I will save the questions for you uh, later on. Uh, but uh, I think in this case, yeah, we might have to skip on the Q and A's because you're not able to. Uh, answer those questions. Uh, but now uh, this is also quite interesting uh, for, for everyone uh, to, to learn a little bit more about LoRa Edge and how mm. this can be applied. I'm really and sorry, but I cannot re hear you. Uh, OK, uh, Scala, I will have to uh, mute you. Uh, Yes. Unfortunately, I think Carlo couldn't hear us. Uh, I will come back to Carlo in a while so that uh, we can address the questions. Uh, but to, I think, summarize his, his, his talk, it was um, quite interesting to see what, uh, what Semtec is doing with, uh, with uh, LoRa Edge and how they, uh, this can be applied in agricultural uh, use cases, particularly with tracking. And as you can tell, also in, in agricultural, uh, your margins are generally quite thin. So the use case really has to be spot on. The solution really has to be spot on. 
and this is one thing which uh, I think is it's it's a very interesting development that is coming up. So uh, yeah, we'll uh, come back to Carlo if we can connect. But uh, moving on, um, we have our next speaker is from Blues Wireless. His name is Brandon. Brandon is a lover of IoT, uh, web, mobile, and he's an avid tinkerer. He loves to talk about sensor, circuits, microcontrollers, open source, robots, and whatever shiny thing or technology can distract him, which I think is a lot more like most of us here. So without uh, much uh, delay, I will pass on to, to, to Brandon. Uh, where is Brandon here? Let me add him here. Hi, Brandon. Hi, Rich. How are you? I'm good. How are you? Doing great. Thank you. Brilliant. Well, over to you. Yeah. Great. Thank so uh, with the framing of sort of the reasons for why Laura and Laura Wynn are so important in difficulties in agriculture, one thing that I wanted to add to that, and this is something that we see a lot at Blues Wireless, is that, and Rish, you just mentioned this yourself with low margins, is the need to create fungible devices. Even if you're tracking expensive assets, even if you're tracking livestock or machinery, this is true. But especially in the case where you're doing things like monitoring uh, soil moisture or monitoring, you know, building environmental sensing so systems and solutions is that the, your bomb cost is so tight and so low that adding a module, adding a Wi-Fi or cellular module into that device can be non-tenable because it may double or triple the cost of the device that you're ultimately attempting to deploy. And so we look a lot at the importance of fungible devices, this ability to actually leverage LoRa uh, and to build low cost sensors and sensor networks that spread your infrastructure costs with gateways and, and backhaul across a larger installation of devices, but allow you to ultimately uh, deploy a solution with a smaller uh, with a smaller initial cost on the per uh, device range. And this is not only important for bomb cost savings, but also for the fact that because we're dealing with a lot of outdoor, um, sometimes extreme conditions, unpredictable weather patterns that you need to also sometimes be able to deploy devices that if they get destroyed by extreme weather, it's not a big deal. It's not a device that costs you two or 300 uh, euros or dollars or whatever it might be per device. You're actually able to build something that is uh, much more fungible. It's the word that we, we tend to use over and over again. And I think that's an important consideration to add as well. And as an area where Laura and Laura Wynn really do a great job of allowing uh, allowing organizations to deploy those larger sensors and, and get a fungible uh, sensor that actually gets out into the field. So that was what I wanted to start with. And Rish, I'm happy to answer any follow-up questions. Yeah. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, while, uh, while you were talking, I had this uh, one question uh, particularly which uh, I wanted to ask. So What's the most exciting thing, at least in the current uh, events, that uh, that makes you very positive and excited about LoRaWAN and scoping it a little bit to agriculture side? You know, I just I think that the standards continue to improve, interoperability to con continues to improve, the work that the LoRa Alliance and uh, a lot of organizations like the Things Network and Semtech have done to to be able to. Uh, you know, build reliable solutions to build interoperable solutions has been has been a fun thing to watch. And I think Laura has become more broadly, Laura and Laura Land in particular, have become more broadly popular over the last several years as the cost of network servers and gateway devices have come down. I think it gets us to that point where, you know, again, using fungibility as a term, it's even cheaper to deploy a gateway or it's even cheaper to actually, uh, you know, get your initial infrastructure out there. And in agriculture settings, I think that's so important because in many cases, uh, yep. you know, Laura and Laura Wynn are not just the best option, but in some cases the only option. And so uh, having a lower bar to get started is something that's pretty exciting for me in a lot of these cases. Yeah, yeah, no, indeed, uh, true. Um, yeah, people, if you have any questions, uh, please post them in the chat. I can uh, read them and I can also ask Brandon. But uh, while we wait for that, and I have one more uh, yeah question on top of that. So uh, someone watching this webinar uh, uh, gets excited about Laura Wen and agriculture, and now they want to, uh, yeah, they want to dive into this. Uh, what would be your two uh, tips to get started? Where do they go? What do they, how do they get started? Uh, you know, there's a couple of different places. There's, um, uh, you know, this is sort of a selfish plug, but I've been doing a little bit of writing lately for All About Circuits on Laura and Laura Wan. And so there's an, you know, there's a lot of uh, content coming out in public places for engineers. If you're designing Laura and Laura Wan solutions like in sensor boards and things like that, All About Circuits is a great 
uh, place to start. And in addition, I'll do a plug for the Things Network because uh, they have some pretty phenomenal documentation for getting started, for actually understanding the individual pieces of building up a LoRaWAN solution from devices to network servers and things like that. So I would definitely uh, start with that as a great place to start from fundamentals, even if you're not using Things Network technology. A fantastic place for really anybody uh, to understand the space and where to go. Perfect. And uh, if anyone wants to start with the fundamentals, uh, one of my colleagues can post the link here in the in the YouTube chat. We have a nice one-hour fundamental course from our CTO, Johan, which clarifies a lot of simple yet basic uh, questions that people have. So uh, to make sure to check it out. I see we have a few questions uh, here. Um, oh, hi, Hush. Uh, great. You have a question. Um, which gateway would you suggest to have a better coverage? Yeah, um, yeah, Brandon, do you want to go? Um, I have a couple of points as well on this, but yeah, uh, go ahead. It, it, that's the classic it depends answer, right? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, if you have some specifics, Rish, I'll let you do that because it would be, it's, it's hard to really pin that down outside of context. It depends on where you are, you know, what part of the spectrum you're using, uh, but there's a ton of, you can't go wrong with almost any gateway, frankly, because there's a lot of options uh, at, at your disposal. Yeah, yeah, indeed. I mean, when uh, when it comes to like agriculture, I think most of the times you are looking at an outdoor gateway, which is slightly more robust and has your waterproof, dustproof, these sort of capabilities. So if you look in the market, you have plenty of options. And especially nowadays, yeah, you have a lot of options. But I think two things that I would uh, uh, highlight here. One is that, uh, yeah, you should pr preferably have a cellular backhaul or make sure that your backhaul part is sorted out. Uh, keeping in mind the conditions that you have or the area that you are in, because, yeah, this is extremely important. And the second thing is, if you have your gateways out in the field, you probably also want to make sure that you have a remote connection with those gateways. So in case things go wrong or in case you want to debug issues, you probably don't want to send someone to the gateway with a laptop and trying to debug because let's be real that's just very uh ineffective so uh yeah make sure whenever whichever vendor you go with whichever model you go with these two considerations uh yeah you're keeping that in mind um and i think for the rest yeah you'll be you'll be good and there's some good options too for external gateway enclosures regardless yeah. of the gateway you pick if you're doing something you know i think rock has a pretty nice uh, outdoor gateway enclosure uh, with pretty good uh, rated for extreme temperatures and can work well uh, with a bunch of different antenna types. And so, yeah, that's another thing for sure. Something outdoor, something that can handle those conditions for uh, definitely helps. Yeah. Yeah. And I think some of the, the folks here would also be wondering, hey, can I have a solar powered gateway, which also is quite a common uh, question that we keep getting, especially in agriculture, because you want to, you don't have any power source in the middle of the farm or in a, in a right. far away area. So there are options on that. Um, yeah, if you need any help on that, reach out to us. We can recommend some partners. We can recommend vendors, but uh, we need uh, that would be uh, good. Uh, I have a few questions. Uh, mm, let me see. Uh, yeah, we actually have quite a few questions, <laughs> which is good. Um, so, Brand, do you have any experience with uh, with uh, GPS trackers? Uh, uh, for uh, yeah, do you have any? Yeah. Can you a few words on what what things to look out for keeping in mind again these trackers are going to be mounted on cows or cattle so these assets yeah the thing that we're to really think about with gps trackers is that they can sometimes uh, run against the grain with your low power needs and so it's a very important thing to think about not just the the tracker solution if you get like a quick tell uh, cellular modem with a built-in tracker or if you get something like an l86 uh, gps module they are very very good devices but there is a power spike when gps is activated and they need to acquire satellites and so depending on how often you need to track as you sort of think about your power budget adding gps gives you not only the you have to think about the lower and lower way inside of your power budget but you need to think about how often you're turning on gps for positioning uh, how you're sipping from the satellites and things like that so that would be a number one, as you're thinking about GPS, is make sure that it works for the power needs uh, of your application and you can adjust how you're powering the project or the frequency of, of sampling from satellites. 
Brilliant. Great. Now that's uh, right. Uh, thanks, uh, Brandon, for your uh, valuable insights. Uh, I hope to see you uh, soon in person. Um, and, yeah, uh, definitely. Brilliant. Great. Thank you, so, Rich. All right. Cheers. Right. So now moving on. Um, I hope, yeah, this was uh, valuable. I see there are more questions. We will address all the questions. So you can keep posting them. I will go through them. And when, when the time for Q&A is, I will take them up. Uh, next up, uh, we have, uh, oh, one second, let me just, yes, uh, yes. Next up, we have Craig from uh, Al IoT. Craig works with uh, several customers across UK, Europe to deliver custom IoT solutions with the best devices, service, and support. And I uh, will pass it on to him. And uh, here's to you, Craig. Uh, is your microphone not working? Uh, How about that? Is that better? Yes. There we go. Perfect. Because yeah, I was on mute. This is the uh, that's the uh, <laughs> the sign of 2021, right? Being on mute. <laughs> so uh, my first thing is to apologise for the shirt. So uh, we run two companies. Uh, one's Proview, one's Elliot. And uh, in uh, true style, I've um, yeah, I've worn the wrong top today. <laughs> that's a uh, marketing, uh, yeah. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. I wish it was all planned. Unfortunately, not. <laughs> So, so uh, I, I'm, apologies. I've only just j literally jumped in backstage a short while ago. So um, I just caught the ends of Brandon's, um, and I know the questions everybody's kind of talking about at the moment is what makes um, uh, agriculture and IoT quite difficult. Um, and the piece that I actually was going to talk about is quite interesting because uh, everybody seems to be talking about it. It's about the coverage. So within agriculture, you don't generally have a lot of infrastructure. You don't have lots of power. Uh, you don't have um, necessary lots of coverage in regards to even cellular um, and stuff like that. So with a limited connect, with limited connectivity, um, that's the piece that we generally find um, people have problems with. So with Laura being kind of the way that Laura is in, in regards to creating your own private network, um, Laura solves that a lot, like very easy. I mean, we we do we're doing some bits in NBIoT, but even the coverage in NBIoT is really sketchy, and we don't anticipate that that even when it's at 100% coverage, it really won't be 100% coverage depending on where you're going. So what we're um, already working on at the moment and have products for is uh, we've got gateways that are kind of backhauled by satellite. We've got gateways that are powered by solar. Um, and one of the questions a little while ago, I think it was from Hirsch, actually. Um, Hirsch said kind of what's the, what's the best gateway, um, which is like how long is a piece of string, as, as uh, Brandon quite rightly said. Um, but the, the, the right way of doing this is just actually go out there and put a gateway down and do a survey because you'll find that the, the best there isn't there isn't a best gateway they, they are all very very good um but what you just need to do is you need to look where you cover it where, you, where where do you need your coverage and then once you've got a start point then you can actually go out there and radio map it and work out how many and where they go and it's actually a lot simpler than people realize so but that's the, that, that's really the piece the, agri, the bit that laura will laura makes a lot easier it is um enabling that coverage of those devices. And we're talking about, um, one of the chaps was talking about um, uh, GPS tracking of, um, of, uh, of animals, et cetera. And we've done a few of those as well. There's, there's, there's commercially deployed kind of um, not just the tags, but also the neck bands for cows and stuff. And we've deployed quite a lot of those. Uh, and again, it, it, they're all there, but you do, you do your, um, you do your radio mapping, you set out your network, your, your coverage area, um, and then what you do is you link the um, the assets to the gateway and, and, and go from there. It's it becomes a very simple answer to a, a, a can be complex problem. So. Yeah, yeah, no, indeed. And I think when you were talking about like, yeah, what is so difficult about uh, IoT, law of and agriculture, I was also thinking like one step ahead that, yes, getting started might be a bit tricky, you know, doing these trials and you have to set up your gateway, see what the coverage is. But on the flip side, if you also look at it, once you have your first use case validated, once you get like the ball rolling, adding other use cases on top of that is fairly easy. So if you Very already easy. have a network on a farm for tracking cows, adding another use case for monitoring uh, grain levels is, is fairly easy because you just buy the device, connect it, and off you go. Exactly so, that. 
And we've done, that's exactly what we've done. We've we kind of worked with some customers that have gone out. So we work with, um, I'm going to be a shameless plug there. For, for, so we've got, I won't do a shameless plug. We've got a farming cooperative that we work with and they do quite a lot of things. So, but we go out initially and, and the initial uh, spec is that we want to, we want to track the, um, the animals um, but the problem so now they know where the animals are because we've got this kind of network up and we've got this asset tracking um, again very easy to deploy works perfectly or I say works perfectly nothing ever works perfectly but works uh, as well as it needs to be uh, they understand they've got geolocation should they move out of an area and etc cetera, etc cetera. but the next problem becomes what like my my um my herd as such sorry for the poor language but my herd as such is getting ill um, and it's because they're now now I've worked out that they're actually they're drinking from this stream rather than drinking from the troughs. Um, why is that? Oh, OK, well, the troughs are empty. OK, so now what we're going to do is we're going to use LoRa um, to track the uh, depth of the troughs and even to turn on and off um, valves to make sure the troughs are full up with water when they need them. And now we're not only looking to make sure we don't lose the, the assets, the cattle, what we're also doing is we're also now looking after the welfare of the cattle. And then that spurs to more and more. And, and then you start to really sweat the gateway. But you're also really improving the return on investment of your your farming capabilities, your, your cattle in this instance. So or, and even your water usage, because the same thing is where previously one of the valves might be left on and it's now overflowing. One of these are doing this um, uh, double level temperatures, uh, level measure, measurement centers is now saying that this is actually overflowing and you're wasting low and water is one of the most expensive um kind of uh, costs that you have on a farm so yeah it's um it is it, it because it's not that difficult i guess is is what i'm trying to say is you've got a complex problem that actually is solved rather easily and then you can really sweat it yeah, yeah, yeah. No, indeed, this is, uh, I think, quite valuable. Uh, and uh, yeah, we have experience with that. We've seen these uh, use cases grow. So uh, no, no, but uh, no, thanks. Thanks a lot, uh, Craig, uh, for your uh, insights. I hope uh, this was uh, useful. Uh, we can come back to the Q&A afterwards, uh, but I think we are running a little bit tight on schedule. So uh, yeah, thanks, uh, Craig. Um, yeah, hope to see you soon. And you too. Uh, cheers. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Right, right. So that was Craig from Al IoT. Uh, yeah, I hope uh, yeah this was uh, yeah quite interesting to learn uh, from from him uh, what type of use cases uh, they are working on and if you need uh, to contact him uh, we'll we'll post the contact details shortly. Moving on uh, next we have uh, Christian from Tectalic. He's uh, vice president of sales and business development uh, at Tectalic. And uh, I know there was a question as to which gateway should you choose. And I think Christian might have an answer to that. So over to you, uh, Christian. I will add you right now. Here you are. Hey. Thanks, Rish. Thank you very much. And uh, thank you for the opportunity to be here. Um, and uh, yeah, the uh, question about which, uh, which gateway to use is, is definitely uh, an, an interesting one. Um, the answer is right here, of course. Um, but I'll, I'll return to the gateway point later because also with interest followed some of the conversations uh, in, in the chat uh, next to this. Um, so what's really important in the choice of gateway has, has been alluded to already. Uh, the gateways for agricultural use cases are typically uh, autonomous, mounted remotely. Uh, so they need to be operated autonomously, meaning they need to have a good solid backhaul capability. They need to have a good uh, watchdog mechanism built in. They need to be remotely monitorable and manageable. So if a gateway uh, is starting to, to deteriorate in performance because of environmental factors, for instance, sometimes literally um, wind may be blowing the antennas um, out of position, uh, things like this related to the option. You can monitor this remotely from the gateway and you can intervene in, in time uh, and anything that can be done by remote intervention is definitely beating uh, having to travel out to, to gateways that may be uh, located on, on remote sites. Uh, I would like to challenge some of the comments about uh, the, the choice of gateway and, and maybe the unimportance because uh, um, you very often see the products from the front. I want to show this product from, uh, from the rear side. Um, 
where you you can see that we actually when we build gateways we built them uh, we built them industrial grade we built them enterprise grade or carrier grade uh, meaning that they will sustain longer uh, autonomous operation in challenging environments whether it's very uh, cold warm uh, we design all gateways with um, a all interfaces on the bottom of the gateway so that uh, you minimize water ingress. And there are little details like this that means you operate the gateway uh, for a longer time without disruption, without having to, to intervene. And we look very for uh, much forward to, uh, to also showcasing a solar powered version uh, of uh, this very gateway uh, at the Norovan World Expo in Paris and also obviously at the Things Conference uh, in, uh, in Amsterdam. Uh, this is a very popular gateway for infrastructure and building that infrastructure is, is very critical. Right, uh, Biano, this is, uh, yeah, I think uh, yeah, I can already see it in the comments uh, how popular this gateway is. So uh, I don't think Tectelic needs any introduction uh, as to yeah, who they are. Um, so I, I have a question now for you. So <clears throat> I think in one of the previous questions, I also mentioned that one of the things that a good gateway needs to have is uh, options for your backhaul. So this particular gateway already has your uh, known uh, backhaul. And the second thing I, I mentioned was that uh, you need to have an ab this ability to, to remotely configure this gateway or fleet of your gateways. So can you maybe talk a little bit about how does this work with uh, the Stectalic Enterprise Gateway? So all our gateways are essentially supported uh, by our uh, management tool, which is uh, available as, uh, as a, a service in the cloud, uh, where you can uh, remotely connect to each gateway. You can update configurations. You can upload firmware revisions and so on. The, um, the gateway actually supports uh, SNMP over MQTT. Uh, so the gateway will also proactively alert if there are any, um, any, any service deterioration in the gateway or anything happening in the gateway that uh, that that requires attention um, and this is a service that that we are operating and and is is available for all our our gateways okay uh, that's good uh, and i see here uh, from uh, some some of the comments uh, yeah can you talk a little bit about how to make uh, these gateways uh, have solar uh, powered uh, because this also keeps coming up uh, again and again especially in uh, some really remote areas so uh, how how does uh, tectalic uh, address this so we have been been offering for a long time actually uh, resources to to document how to solar power, how uh, to ensure that that the battery bank has enough capacity, how much uh, how much uh, generation do you need from from the panels, um, and we have some very successful use cases where our gateways are uh, uh, fed through solar panels. Uh, this gateway has an, an extremely low power consumption already because we built it uh, specifically for, uh, for for remote installation use cases and to support these. So you have an, an, an ongoing power consumption that is, is extremely lean. Uh, but as mentioned, we are working on, on an integrated uh, concept where instead of tailoring your own uh, solution with sourcing batteries from over here and panels from over there and a controller here, that we're able to offer all this in, in an integrated package. Um, and, and that's what we'll be uh, showcasing on, on important events uh, this summer. I can't wait for that. Uh, so yeah, for sure, I will see you in Paris. And See you in Amsterdam as well. So before you go, um, I have one uh, last question. So where can people buy your gateway? Who, who do they reach out? Where can they get started if they want to buy Tectalic gateways? Yeah, so uh, you operate, of course, your uh, your your site on, on the Things Industries website where people can go and, and, and order. And uh, in addition to this, we are present with, uh, with local distribution partners uh, everywhere in uh, on, on the planet, uh, essentially, that can supply these uh, these gateways and, and support them in local frequencies with local certification and local approvals, um, almost wherever you are on, on the planet. Brilliant. Great. Uh, thanks a lot, Christian, uh, for your insights. Uh, hope to see you soon. Great. Thank you. Thank you for having me. All right. Cheers. Bye-bye.
Great. So yeah, that was uh, Christian from Tectalic. Uh, I hope uh, this was uh, quite useful. If you have any questions, uh, yeah, feel free to post them in the chat. Either my colleagues will answer it or the speakers here will also take a part and they can also answer these questions. So moving on next, uh, let me put him on the screen. Um, we have uh, Luca from Irnas, and uh, yeah, if you've been with us, uh, you know who's Lucas, but I will uh, give a formal introduction. He's the founder and head of development at Irnas. He uh, has a great team where they develop uh, systems for the future, which ranges from specialized IoT devices to open medical devices and even 3D bioprinting. I know some of you guys would, would know about that. So uh, over to you, uh, Lucas. Perfect. Uh, very nice to see you virtually again, Rish, and hopefully Rish. soon uh, in real life as well. Um, so yeah, super excited uh, to be here. You know, agriculture is a very interesting uh, space to be in. And in a very broad sense, uh, we do a lot in this space. Um, so to give you some context, you know, we work from, let's say, the smallest devices, which would be something like ear tags on animals, uh, doing either beacons and uh, positions for very basic diagnostics to, let's say, the more wildlife side of things, all the way down to implants inside rhino horse. You can see the one here at the back. Um, and yeah, more like on the industrial side, uh, plenty of animal tracking, um, for example, with uh, units of this sort, uh, which is essentially a digital bell uh, for sheep and reindeer and so forth. Um, so you don't need to hear it, but you go and find it uh, through your phone app. Um, and well, various, various things um, down the road um, to create things, even like phenology cameras. You may see someone at the back there in the white box uh, which you know looks at the plants, looks at the color, the frequent, uh, the spectrum, and tells you the health of the plants. And lately, we've been working with uh, an organization doing IoT devices powered from the plants themselves, so without the batteries and generating power from there. Um, so it's a very exciting space. But to give you something useful, uh, pretty much to think about is what we see for higher added value agriculture devices. People might actually go for LoRa and N by EIT solutions, both combined in one device, uh, making sure that you always have at least one type of connectivity available. Um, but where we really see uh, LoRa on shines in the agriculture space is when you have a large enough density of uh, devices. Um, you know, so if you have, let's say, under 10 sensors of various different types scattered around the farm, um, running a LoRa network might be a bit of a stretch. Uh, for you, but as soon as you start scaling this up, you know, maybe you have a hundred animals with uh, trackers, you have a GPS tracker on your tractor and all of the attachments, so you know where they are. Um, plus, quite some other things, uh, you end up with a really nice group um, of devices talking to one or you gateways you have in space. Um, what works quite nicely in that case is also uh, if you have like a hill or you know, somewhere. Up top, you can place your gateway, uh, run connectivity uh, from there for all devices. And yeah, life is very good uh, from that space. Um, where, for example, on the downside, uh, we see a challenge with the LoRa network is um, if you have really large geographic distribution, then building the network, you know, like multiple gateways and running the whole thing might be a bit challenge for you know, a single farmer who doesn't have the purpose for that. Obviously, if you have an IT department, you're good, but not many people are in. Um, that space. Um, I see some questions in chat related to the battery powers. Um, so we see a lot of the solutions being powered by primary batteries these days. Um, while solar is really nice for a lot of applications, it does get somewhat difficult to validate in certain cases. Um, for example, if you have sensors which run solar, as long as you can make sure they're in the sun, life is good. It you know, runs perfectly fine. But if you have them randomly scattered, some are in trees, some are in sheds, some are outside, that gets trickier and you do you know, primary cells, which you know exactly how much power uh, will be used and how long the device will run. Um, and from that perspective, the difference maybe between LoRa one networks and NVAT LTM, so any kind of mobile network is, on LoRa devices, you can be much more predictable about the power consumption because you know how a message sent, like you know how much power is consumed versus on the NVAT and LTM devices, you in theory know how much power is consumed, but it's also a function of the network. So if the network behaves differently, 
your power consumption profile can drastically change. Um, so this is an important thing to keep in mind when you do the trade-offs, what kind of solution uh, do you want on your end? Um, and also cost-wise to mention, uh, definitely um, higher number of devices. So if you have, you know, let's say, 100 or so devices per gateway, lower on is much cheaper and much more efficient. If you have you know, one device or two devices per gateway and the cost of the gateway, you could also pay for the SIM card. But on a larger number, lower on really, really shines. Um, so definitely, you know, welcome some more uh, questions and yeah. Yeah, no, that was, uh, that was good. Uh, yeah, so anyone who has a question, uh, please uh, post them in the chat and uh, we'll, uh, we'll take it up. Um, so I have a question for you, Luca. Um, so what are the most, uh, let's say, like the, the obvious pitfalls that people typically fall into when they start with LoRaWAN and particularly agriculture? I'm sure you know a few uh, that people can avoid. Sure. So uh, the first one is doing too much in one device. So lower devices work really well if they're you know single one purpose devices. You typically don't need to ever update, so to speak. Um, as soon as you start creating you know multi sensor, multi purpose devices, you know kind of one do it all. Uh, it gets difficult because updating devices, which you will definitely need to do if you have so many functions you can't really test them. Um, you will need a good downlink mechanism and you know doing updates through LoRa while it's possible, it's not really convenient and very easy to do uh, in most cases. Um, so the, the devices, you know, have single purpose devices, make them as cheap as possible. And even if you have an insane location, have a device say for the water level, have a device for the gate opening and so forth. Don't combine things too much uh, because that will make things a lot more difficult. Yeah, no, that's uh, that's uh, interesting, and I think this also answers the question which was going in the chat. Uh, someone was asking, "Hey, I want to put multiple sensors on a tractor or something. Uh, is it better mm -hmm. than putting one or multiple?" So I hope uh, this uh, this answers it. Another question, which I think I keep getting it quite a bit, and is I think also good to shed some light on, is a lot of times people think I need a custom sensor or I need to design my own sensor, and maybe there is already a sensor which is available in the market. So, what's your advice? for people to decide whether they should go for a customized sure. device, considering in mind the supply chain issues that we have right now versus going for off the shelf. Right, so the answer is you should absolutely not go for a custom device unless you have a very good reason. To. So how you go about it is quite simple. You first start with an off the shelf device. You find whatever is the closest to what you need. You know, might not be exactly what you're after, but just find the closest device start using it because this will give you roughly the experience of what you're trying to achieve. You see how it works. You see the range the, like you will get quite far down the line. Um, then if you have a large enough need for devices with you know, slight tweaks and modifications, uh, a good option is uh, say go for the things that were generic now or you know, work with any manufacturer which will tweak the device to your needs. And if that is not sufficient and you have very good reasons for a custom device, then we're happy to build one. But yeah, we, we always ask those questions and push back, like, do you really need a custom one? Because that's a lot of work and a lot of effort. Yeah, this is uh, good. I mean, yeah, I would also say the same, but uh, I, yeah, I hope uh, people uh, get this uh, message. Uh, we have a question from Frank, uh, who wants to know, does your Rhino tracker work without GPS? Well, it does certainly work without GPS. It's not very useful without it, though. Uh, meaning that inside, actually, we have two GPS receivers. Um, so we have a U-Blocks receiver, which gives us precise positioning upon request when we need it, as well as we have the Semtech LR1110 uh, for positioning, which offers very quick and low power GPS fixes. Um, so this is, as far as I know, the one device uh, on the market which combines them both, uh, meaning you can do precise positioning, say, every 12 hours and every 15 minutes get an update. You know, it's in this 100 meter range. Um, and if you need a precise position, then you can request it with the downlink. Um, so that really opens up a lot of different opportunities on a pretty small battery. Right. And we have uh, another question from Tom. Uh, he wants to know if you have any experience with the MKR van 1310 in an industrial uh, setting. Sure. So um, we've used it uh, in a few cases, um, but we've generally found that making it really low power is sometimes a challenge. Um, so also for scaling up, it's reasonably pricey. So I would suggest, you know, if you want to roll out first, 
50 to 100 devices with that, go for it because it will you know, bring you out to the market very quickly. But after that, you likely need to find a different solution. Right. Great. Uh, thanks a lot, uh, Luca, for I think uh, some of your answers were, were really interesting and I uh, hope uh, yeah, people got uh, what they were looking for here. Uh, so thanks a lot. Uh, hope to see you uh, sometime soon. And uh, yeah, thanks uh, for your time. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me. Great, great. Great. So uh, that mostly yeah, con concludes our webinar. I'm going to try one more time with uh, Carlo uh, to see if uh, we can hear him. Uh, Carlo, uh, I'm here. Yes. Great. Okay, fine. Good. Now, again, sorry. Now I fixed my my issue with the, the browser. Yeah, actually. That's, that's good. Uh, well, uh, you do get a special chance now to come back uh, to your uh, Q&A. So if anyone has a question for uh, Carlo, please post it in the chat. But uh, while uh, people take their time, I Luca mentioned uh, something about LoRa uh, Edge and LR1110. So can you maybe shed a light about it? How does this fit in into agriculture and what does it aim to solve? Absolutely. This resonates a lot with a few questions that I, I saw um, coming in in the, in the chat about power consumption and how could really to conciliate the, 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 the need for a geolocation, uh, fixing position with GNSS uh, technology, uh, with the fact that we have to deal with a, a very limited power envelope availability on, on the device. So. Uh, our LoRa Edge uh, platform brings this capability, this, the possibility to have a geolocation position with a very low power consumption. And especially for those use cases where you need seldom, I will say, uh, fixing, okay? One, two, fixing uh, per hour, for instance, okay? Here is where our technology shines. Uh, with a power consumption that can be, I mean, rough, I mean can be estimated roughly at 10 times lower than what a traditional uh, GNSS uh, can offer, okay? Uh, it's lower age, it's uh, about uh, uh, merging uh, silicon capability, the integration uh, that is offered today by, by advanced silicon technologies with uh, cloud uh, solving. So really, we, we uh, through our LoRa Edge and, and, the, and one exa the example is what uh, Lucas showed a few few minutes ago. Uh, the trackers based with our uh, LR1110, okay, which is a chip of our, our LoRa Edge uh, family. So really, what we do is that we we use the silicon to uh, listen the satellites, but also Wi-Fi uh, access points. Uh, get the minimum um, required information from those. Uh, I will say beaconing uh, 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 instruments and then send everything to our cloud where the and, and where the, 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 the calculation, the fixing is done. And so this uh, uh, operation that consumes uh, a lot of power is uh, unloaded to the cloud. And here is how we really shine in terms of uh, uh, power consumption. Yeah, no, that's uh, indeed. And I think what you mentioned also in the beginning that uh, most of the use cases in agriculture typically start from monitoring and tracking. And this with LR1110, I think this is really yes. hitting it on the nail. So, uh, yeah, no, this was uh, really insightful. Uh, I think we, uh, we have one more question from Florian. Um, he wants to know what is your use case to make? Uh, okay, so this is a question uh, for, I think, which is going between the chat. Um, Okay, I think I will leave that question in the chat so people can answer that. But I have a question for you. Uh, so uh, what lies ahead uh, in this? Uh, what can we as the ecosystem do to, to increase this appetite for LoRa within the agricultural uh, vertical? Yeah, good question. Thanks for asking this. Uh, and I, I, what I can say is that uh, beside this livestock monitoring and tracking, we now we have... Uh, really solid reasons to 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 believe that uh, uh, the direct to satellite connectivity uh, that is now available through uh, uh, LRFHSS and also uh, through um, multiband capabilities that we recently added to LoRa Edge uh, family with the uh, recent LR1120 device. So this direct low power and affordable low um, low cost uh, uh, direct um, sensor to satellite connectivity is opening the way to trigger 
uh, a stronger wave of adoption in uh, other use cases uh, than, than livestock tracking. Essentially, uh, the, the, the possibility to, to simply plug uh, a sensor and get this connectivity without having to deal with installing a gateways or, or managing a network, okay? And this is something that uh, at the beginning for, for farmers, it's, it's, a, it's a bit difficult to justify. They, most of the time they start with very few sensors, okay? They are very sensitive to cash flow, okay? So, and, and, and so really having the possibility to get rid of the network installation and, and deployment and management at the beginning will provide them an easy way to, to test the use case, get the value, uh, quantify the ROI that can get from uh, to quantify the value of the data they can get from the uh, from the monitoring, and at the end they will they will decide if there is a, it, it's worth to deploy a network and then densify the 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 uh, the sensors deployments or stay with the uh, few sensors directly connected to the uh, to the satellite. Really, this is in my opinion going to be um, a huge enabler of other use cases. Uh, really, yeah, a, a response, providing a response to, to our farmers. Yeah. yeah. And it is, uh, yeah, it's a bit of a game changer as well, uh, especially in this uh, vertical. So uh, now indeed. Um, great. Uh, thanks a lot, uh, Carlo. So you're finally able to get you back for the Q&A. So that's good. Um, yeah. So this uh, also brings us uh, Towards the end of this webinar, uh, we covered quite a lot of broad topics around agriculture. So I hope uh, this was uh, useful. Uh, yeah, if you have any more question or if you want to know more about how we as the Things Industries can help you in your agricultural solution, drop us a line. Uh, we'll post uh, the emails uh, in the chat. So uh, yeah, we can help you out with uh, yeah vendor selection, making sure that your uh, proof of concept really scales. If you have any other challenge that we can help you with, feel free to reach out. Last but not the least, uh, yeah, we have the conference, the big things conference coming up in September. So make sure to block that in your calendar if you haven't do that. And uh, yeah, it's going to be nice in summer uh, in Amsterdam. And uh, yeah, we can't uh, wait to uh, make that happen. Uh, plenty of announcements, plenty of surprises coming up. So uh, yeah, make sure to uh, check check it out. And that's it, uh, yeah, from uh, from this webinar. Um, yeah, this was really good, interacting with a lot of uh, broad um, uh, speakers uh, who were there. Uh, and um, yeah, and uh, I think with that, I would uh, conclude this webinar. Uh, enjoy your evening, enjoy your morning, and uh, see you guys around. Bye-bye.